Well, hello everybody. It's time for lecture six on the drug uh, biologics approval process. Uh, that's part two of the drug biologics approval process. And we pick up where we left off before with the post-marketing process. Uh, because the applicant's responsibilities don't just end with the NDA. After the NDA is approved for marketing, um, the sponsor goes forward and markets its products, but things continue thereafter. Um, and uh, post-marketing requirements have become the wave of the future. Increasingly, um, uh, sponsors are required as a condition of approval to move forward and do things after marketing to assure uh, the um, safety of the drug and uh, to further reestablish its effectiveness in, in, clinical, uh, in a clinical way, in a, cl in a real life clinical setting. So uh, there are three kinds of supplements after uh, marketing approval that I want to go over. The, uh, and they are categorized in accordance with uh, prior approval supplements. That means that, hey, you want to do something different um, that goes beyond your NDA, you have to um, get prior approval from us. Uh, so FDA has to receive and approve a supplement before the change can actually go into effect. So things like changes to the manufacturing, changes to the equipment that's used, changes to the facility that's used, changes in the formulation of the drug, um, changes in the labeling. Um, there are certain exemptions for those, but um, they all require prior approval. So they're a prior approval supplement. So a change for a uh, new indication, for example, would be a prior approval supplement. Changes being affected uh, supplements, in contrast, the sponsor can make the change um, before the FDA actually goes ahead and approves the supplement. Um, so these are, are changes to the NDA that have really only moderate adverse event potential. Um, there are two categories of changes being affected supplements. One is called the CBE, for change being affected 30, and um, that may or may not incorporate the change um, if the, 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 the sponsor may or may not be able to incorporate the change if within 30 days the FDA says that there, it should be instead a prior approval supplement. So you got like this 30-day window that you've got to work with in order to make sure that it actually happens. And the second is the CBE, or change being affected, zero, which includes um, uh, smaller methods of assurance like um, changing in the container or a very minor change to the label. That would be a CBE zero type change being affected supplement. And then that third category, you can see we're decreasing in level of um, importance and severity, is changes that only need to be listed um, in the NDA annual report. So there's an annual report that's also required. Many things like orphan drug status requires an annual report. Um, your IND requires an annual report. Your uh, NDA requires an annual report. Um, and these uh, third category of supplements are so minor, uh, they're really truly minimal, such as um, uh, the deletion of a coloring or the reduction in a coloring uh, of, the, of the formulation, it's things that really have n virtually no effect on the safety of the patient. Um, there was a key provision in uh, the Food and Drug Amendments Act of 2007, which stated that the FDA has authority to make sponsors uh, make safety-related changes in the label. So. The label is what a lot of this is about, and you should spend some time with labels looking at them. They are the essential document, uh, the legal document that governs um, drug uh, rules. They are the, 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 the piece of paper that has the most single effect upon how a drug is regulated, um, and yet they really are very hard to read, to tell you the truth. Um, I think that FDA used to rely um, uh, improperly upon the label as the medium through which to communicate to physicians, prescribing physicians, what the risks and benefits and the underlying um, um, validity is of uh, that, the, that the drug is effective. And it has since learned or come to realize that, uh, in fact, it is a rather dense document that is, um, has so many adverse events in it that it is difficult to properly interpret without careful study of ancillary sources of information. So the Kefidah provision was that we've got 
FDA now has the authority to make uh, to require changes to the label. Uh, if the FDA learns of a new safety um, problem, it has 30 days to submit. Uh, the sponsor has and, and informs the sponsor of it. Sponsor has 30 days um, to submit a um, potential supplement, and then um, there's a process of negotiation that goes on. There's specific deadlines for all that negotiation. But you should know that the communication between sponsors and the agency with regards to what's in the label particularly with regards to safety, is an activity in which the agency engages um, routinely, regularly, and is an important component of regulatory affairs. Let's talk a little bit about adverse drug experiences, or ADEs. This is very um, circuitously defined as um, any adverse event that is associated with the use of drug. So notice that it's associated with the use of the drug. It doesn't require causality. It doesn't mean that, oh, that drug caused that adverse event. In order to be an adverse event, it just means I took the drug and I walked out in the street and got hit by a car. Okay? That's an, that's an adverse drug experience. You had the drug associated with walking out and getting hit by a car. Whether that was truly... Uh, causal or not, in some cases of psychotropic medicines that cause all kinds of wacky stuff, maybe it is. In other cases, it may be completely, completely unrelated. But nevertheless, they both qualify as an adverse drug event. Um, there are two things you need to know about adverse drug events. One is whether they are serious or non-serious. Um, and a serious adverse drug event is defined as something that is fatal, life-threatening, or permanently disabling. And a non-serious adverse event is something that is neither fatal nor life-threatening nor um, uh, resulting in a permanent disability, uh, or non-serious. And so, so one component is what is um, serious. The other component is what is expected, whether an adverse drug event is expected or not. And expected is defined as it was already on the label. Those things are expected because they were detected in the clinical trials, or it is unexpected. It wasn't found on the label. Now, if you have an adverse drug event which is both serious and unexpected, then you, the sponsor, are required to submit a report of this to the FDA within 15 days. Okay? And then the FDA can decide how it's going to take action. The FDA can withdraw the NDA uh, if the drug use is under the label and found later to be unsafe. Um, for example, if there's additional clinical evidence. It can seek withdrawal if the label is found to be false or misleading. If there's any false statement of material fact in the original application, it can also withdraw the, uh, withdraw the application. It can withdraw the application if it finds that the patent uh, issues were not uh, clearly stated. Um, withdrawal usually requires a hearing, and this is a very rare event. Basically, most drug um, approvals are a one-way street. Drugs get on the market, and they don't usually come off the market very easily. The agency doesn't like, well, I don't want to say it doesn't like to do it. It, it upholds its, um, its statutory responsibility to protect public health, but it um, is onerous, and there's a pretty high standard for removing a drug from the uh, from the marketplace. So, due care, lots of care, is given before in in, in the review and the approval process. Um, phase four studies, as I mentioned, are post marketing studies, and uh, they can be a prerequisite to approval. It can be that the the sponsor will say, okay, you can approve it, you, you, you can go forward and market your drug, but you have to do this safety or, and this follow-on efficacy study. So they offer new safety data, new efficacy data. Um, uh, most importantly, they determine real use, real world usage because clinical trials usage may not exactly be the same as real world usage. Um, phase four studies may allow FDA to grant earlier approvals than otherwise. Um, and FDA, F the AAA, the Food and Drug Amendments Act of 2007, bolsters this authority greatly um, to do Phase four studies. Uh, it includes concepts like patient registries. Uh, there is concern that if an adverse event is so rare that a clinical trial can't detect it, and this happens, where there might be a serious adverse event like fulminant um, hepatic necrosis, okay? You take this pill, you're going to die. Your liver is going to 
crutch to mush, okay? And I've seen it on slides. Um, but if it happens one out of every 10,000 times, and you've only got, you know, 3,000 people in your clinical trial, which is still a lot of people costing hundreds of million dollars, well, mm, you're not going to detect it in your clinical trials. You're only going to detect it in post-marketing sense. So uh, if there were some signals, such as from the uh, uh, toxicology signals or um, um, some early increases in liver enzymes, it could be that the, um, the agency would require a, a, a follow-on study. It's required to use the late, least um, uh, intrusive means. So if it can be done through an epidemiologic study rather than a full-blown clinical trial where people are enrolled and, and very resource intensive, then it will do that. But it is not required to, and it is required to protect the public health of the American people. So, um, okay. And so uh, what else are we going to tell you about this uh, post-marketing stuff? Um, Oh, failure to comply with um, post-marketing requirements carries very high fines. However, there was a recent GAO report, this is not included in your book, uh, of post-marketing commitments and the FDA's failure to follow up on its post-marketing commitments with sponsors. And it, it did not look good, to tell you the truth. The FDA was seen as uh, not following through. And maybe some of those things have... Uh, been improved since that time, but the GAO is the Government Accountability Office. I mentioned it in earlier, and um, and not everything was uh, followed up on in that report. Uh, it, found, it took the FDA to task on it. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about market protection and uh, in the approval process, um, the ways that a sponsor can retain um, its control of the market because drugs are different from making handbags or making um, automobiles or making other things in the marketplace. Um, special provisions have been afforded drug makers so that they can um, retain greater market exclusivity and thereby um, and thereby market their products and bring together bring forward new innovative products. So it's a big deal. Um, there are three main components of market protection. The first is uh, well, we have patents, okay? Every, every article that is in commerce uh, could uh, receive a patent, but uh, drug, um, drug uh, provisions have uh, special patent term extension provisions. So there's patent term extension provisions. There's non-patent exclusivity provisions for um, NCEs, new chemical entities. And then there's non-patent orphan drug exclusivity, which is my own, uh, my own favorite for obvious reasons. So uh, patent term extensions are um, a reality. The reality is that patents are in place long before marketing. So some guy in a laboratory says, Eureka! And it takes like forever to get that Eureka out into a human being patient. I mean, it can take 20, 30 years. And so the normal patents would already expire. And so in 1984, there were amendments to the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act to extend the patents if, number one, uh, the patent hadn't expired. Number two, there were uh, no previous patent extensions, so you only get one per customer. And uh, number three, um, the drug was subject, indeed subject to regulatory review. So the extension length is based upon the regulatory review period, including um, the testing period, which is defined as the time from IND filing until NDA filing, and then the approval period, which is defined as the time from the NDA submission until um, approval of the NDA, so full marketing. So the uh, patent extension is uh, um, reduced by the period prior to the patient issuance of any, uh, I'm sorry, prior to the patent issuance. Okay, so prior to the patent issue, if you didn't get your patent until late, well, it's, it's reduced by that amount, and to any undue lags on the part of the sponsor. If you didn't, uh, you know, move things along and the FDA finds that you didn't move things along, then, then it can't do that. So um, the patent uh, is extended for, get this, one half of the testing period and all of the approval period. Um, you have to file this with the Commissioner of Patents, but the FDA has to get involved because it's involved in knowing um, some of the other dates of the NDA approval and all that. Um, and you have to file with the patent, um, the Commissioner of Patents within 60 days of getting your NDA approved. So you can get your patent extended, and you will want to, 
if uh, you have uh, some testing period, which presumably you do, from time from IND until NDA filing, and some approval, and you get half of that, and some approval period, which is um, the time from NDA filing until NDA approval, assuming you go forward and get approved. And you will likely want to do that because it's in your best interest to do so. Um, okay, so those are patent extensions. Next, statutory exclusivity um, for NCEs based on new studies. And this is the Hatch-Waxman Act. Um, if the NDA contains an agreement, an ingre it was part of the Hatch-Waxman Act, if the NDA contains an ingredient that has never before been approved by the FDA, then it's called an NCE, a new chemical entity. So no generics can be submitted for five years from the NDA approval. So you have a complete exclusivity for five years from the time that your NDA is approved. Um, this will delay generic competition by five years uh, plus the FDA generic review time. Uh, the exception is that a generic may submit an ANDA um, and that's an abbreviated uh, new drug application, beginning at four years if they're challenging the patent under uh, subpart four, which you'll hear about shortly. Okay, so um, there is another form of statutory exclusivity, which is that you get three years uh, for an NDA supplement if the reports are for uh, new clinical uh, studies that are essential to approval. So if you've got a new indication, you do new clinical trials, you can get an additional three years for your NDA supplement of exclusivity. And lastly, there is orphan exclusivity, which we could talk about a fair bit, but the point is we recognize that orphan drugs were not getting enough um, interest, and so they made a very generous offer, a gener generous statute that said, okay, if you get um, if you get orphan status designation, the first thing you have to do is get orphan status designation, and I recommend you all take um, Dr. Ian Phillips' class on orphan status designation. I will help with that um, by demonstrating to the director of the OOPD that number one, um, your product has promise for the treatment of this rare disease or condition, and number two, um, it is for the treatment or con uh, of a disease or condition that affects fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. If you prove those two things, Boom, you get orphan status designation. Get orphan status designation prior to your submission of your NDA for that orphan indication, and you get orphan desig uh, you get um, approved for treating that rare disease or condition. You have seven years of market exclusivity, so uh, considerably longer than uh, you would get for just an NCE. Um, okay. So, there, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention in orphan designation is that the definition of what's the same and different in orphans is different from the designation of what is the same and different for um, drugs. So what's, a, what's different in drugs? What, what makes two drugs different? A covalent bond, say. So a new chemical entity is, if you, you, could ha if you have two that are the same new chemical entities, the moiety, they're considered the same for drug regulation, for regular um, Hatch-Waxman exclusivity. However, in orphan drugs, a new formulation which is shown to be clinically superior under which there are three different types. You could be more effective, you could be safer, or you could be a major contribution to patient care, uh, which that last characteristic is very, um, um, it's a very high bar for that, uh, but if you had, say, only there was only an IV formulation, and you was had you could create a PO formulation of the same uh, uh, moiety. Then you would consider that a major contribution uh, to patient care, and you could receive seven years of exclusivity for this improved um, formulation. Uh, so there you go. The last kind of exclusivity that the text mentions that I want to mention is uh, pediatric exclusivity. The best pharmaceutical for Children's Act, or BPCA, uh, outlined a, a, uh, a scheme by which uh, you could get an additional six months of patent extension for an NDA-approved drug if the sponsor uh, completes a pediatric study in response to a request from the FDA. So the FDA says, hey, we got this drug and we don't know enough about how it works in children. So we're going to go ask the sponsor to do some special clinical trials. And if they do, then we're going to give you six months of additional exclusivity. And this has proven to be a very uh, productive um, event. And people actually want just those six months 
of additional exclusivity that they get for doing special pediatric trials. Okay, so let's talk about some variations now on the NDA process. Um, the first ones, I want to talk about some um, non-NDA routes to market. The, uh, quote, not new drugs. Some of this is ancient history, okay? But you want to know it so that you can um, understand when people are talking about other non-NDA uh, routes to market. Um, to facilitate generic uh, competition for the post-1938 drugs um, up until 1962, which, so before, uh, after 1938, um, the standard and the ways that operations occurred were that um, drugs were approved unless they were disapproved. Whereas after 1962, um, drugs required affirmative approval. So there's a, a difference in that. And in order to facilitate more generic uh, competition, FDA would inform the sponsors of their newness and whether it's generally recognized as safe grass, and that's something you'll hear more about with regards to over-the-counter medications, based on U.S. usage, whether it was used in the U how it was used in the U.S. And this ended in 1968. Um, one concept you need to hear about is the DESI system, or the Drug Efficacy Study Implementation Review. This was a big piece of work at the agency, and in 1962, it required a retroactive re-evaluation of all the new drugs from 1938 until 1962. So um, the National Science, Sciences Academy, Academy, National Sciences Academy and the um, National Research Council established a council to review all the data on all these drugs and make recommendations. So FDA was to withdraw uh, the ineffective drugs. And as a byproduct of this, it created the ANDA process. Um, there was a paper NDA uh, post-1962 for drugs that were going off patent in the 1970s. And they really had no means of having a competing uh, uh, competing versions without repeat testing, you know, all the clinical trials again, and that just didn't make any sense. So FDA expanded the DESI process um, and uh, the ANDA to create a DESI review with a paper NDA, it was called. It was very short-lived. Um, it, didn't, it didn't stay as a regulatory structure for very long, but it was a bridge to the modern generics, um, and it invoked a new concept. The concept was, let's allow the um, new drugs to go forward based upon data that was submitted from its um, referent drug, okay? Um, based upon the submission, but actually what, what it did first was based upon the submission of publicly available reports. Uh, and this survives today as the 505B2 process. So enter the the field of modern generics and what were those systems that we live today in 1983. Um, neither patent extensions nor an, uh, an ANDA bill could independently pass. So, you know, the, um, the, the innovator companies wanted patent extensions. The generic companies wanted an ANDA bill. So they passed them together. This is where um, Hatch-Waxman comes in. Um, they, the generics and innovators agreed to cooperate on the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act, uh, which was passed in 1984. So the purpose was to make drugs cheaper. That's what Congress wanted to do, to make them cheaper for the American people, but just as safe and effective. So it established this abbreviated process where you could use the innovators' data, not just what was reported, out in the out in you know the scientific literature, but, but what was within the agency, you could reference that data um, for uh, testing and uh, 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 and contemplated submission. This was key because otherwise uh, it would be a long time after the patent expiration that a um, that a generic manufacturer could do all that work. The A and A requirements are that it must include uh, the proposed drug previously ap approved by FDA proof that the ingredient is the same, proof that it's the same right of administration, dosage, form, or strength, proof that it's bioequivalent, that it gets into the body and gets distributed through the body the same way, proof that the label is the same, proof that it's the same basic technical information as in the NDA, and uh, with a list of the methods and the facilities, uh, there need to be samples of the product and a label, and finally, patent certification that of the patent cer status of the reference drug. 
So let's go into that a little bit. In 1984 required the issuance of this thing we call the Orange Book, almost scriptural in import within the FDA. Um, it's a monthly list of all approved drugs. So this is the first stop if you're putting forward an ANDA. Your ANDA must uh, have a copy of, it must copy an orange book entry. So it's got to be something that's there. In the, now, however, if the drug was withdrawn from the orange book, um, FDA has to decide if it was withdrawn for reasons of safety or efficacy, or if instead it was just withdrawn for purposes of marketing. Um, and if it was withdrawn for just purposes of marketing, you may be free and clear to still go forward with your, your ANDA. Uh, but if there were safety or efficacy reasons, then they can stop you right there. Um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, permits the ANDA to have differences so long as uh, they don't affect the safety or efficacy. Uh, you have to, so that's why it's bioequivalence. Um, consider combination products. Uh, it gets really confusing. Uh, with this, the FDA must prove an ANDA uh, suitability petition, and I commend you to the text to look at that a little bit more on competition, on combination products and a the ANDA process. So bioequivalence is the key word. Um, there needs to be, quote, an absence of a significant difference. Um, the regs provide policies for methods to determine whether it's enough the same or different. Uh, in practice, the ANDA must have some human studies. Um, the regs say that you could have in vitro or in vivo or both. Um, FDA can, uh, for good cause, for a good reason, waive the requirement for new human studies if the waiver is compatible with public health. So there needs to be this patent certification, which I just referenced. There are four different types of patent certification. Number one, you could say, oh, the information on the patent, the original patent, hasn't been submitted with the FDA uh, by the patent owner. And uh, you can look that up by seeing what's in the Orange Book. Number two is that uh, the patent has already expired. Uh, number three is that the patent will expire on this date. That's why I'm submitting this now. And number four is that um, the patent is invalid. So these are called paragraphs four. So paragraph one or two, um, the FDA can just immediately approve uh, the ANDA. Uh, par if there's paragraph three patent certification, the FDA um, must make the approval date on the date that the patent expires. But if there's a paragraph four saying that the, uh, the patent uh, is indefensible or it's wrong or... Um, we, we can fight this, then it gets really complicated. Um, the FDA is required to inform um, the patent holder, the, the innovator company, of the ANDA submission and 30 to 60 days after filing, unless there's a refusal to file the ANDA, which we talked about earlier with any other refusal to file. You just didn't put all the stuff together. Um, if the lawsuit, uh, the patent holder can contest this, in, the patent holder can contest this in court. Um, and if the lawsuit is brought, the FDA is frozen from um, issuing the ANDA approval for 30 months. Uh, the statute also says that paragraph 4 is, quote, an artificial act of patent infringement. So there's some ris risk in this. If you infringe on somebody's patent, they can whack you for this, and there can be remedies. Um, but there is also an incentive to move forward in that um, generics who file uh, a paragraph 4 claim do get 180 days over their competitors. So their process, the, the other competitor generics will not be accepted for another 180 days. They're probably going to be the first to market, the generic version. Um, and first to market advantage is uh, economically lucrative. Um, so paragraph 505B2 is uh, the new and currently existing paper NDA uh, process. It was established in 1984, and unlike the old paper NDA, um, doesn't require published reports. Instead, you get um, their data without, uh, you know, you get the data of the innovator country, company without a right of reference. And this has many, many uses. Um, you can get a new indication for an old drug and reference uh, the original innovator's NDA's um, safety data, for example, and not have to do all that studies yourself. So I hope that's clear. Let's move on to over-the-counter drugs. Um, to avoid being a new drug, you have to be uh, GRAS, generally recognized as safe, or, and, actually not or, but and, 
gray, G-R-A-E, generally recognized as effective. And such recognition has to be based on published data on safety and efficacy, and it has to be used um, to a material extent, the, the drug has to be used to a material extent, and for a material time under the labeled conditions. Um, started in, uh, starting in 1972, the FDA established the OTC review. So there's a new pro there was a process for how do we determine if something is uh, recognized in that way, is generally recognized as safe, generally recognized as effective. Um, what happens is that the FDA issues a call for data in the Federal Register. Remember our friend the Federal Register? Somebody should bring in a copy of the Federal Register just so that everybody can see it. And um, it's a, it, it call, there's a call for data. It says, hey, give us data on your, um, on your compound that you think can be um, issued over the counter. And then FDA convenes expert advisory panels. We talked a little bit about advisory panels, which will review the data and report on grass or gray for um, the ingredients now. We're not talking about specific products, but just the ingredients. And that's what the advisory committee does. And it categorizes them. Uh, category one is that they are grass and gray, um, generally recognized as safe and generally recognized as effective. Category three is that they are not, that they are either un unsafe, ineffective, or both. And category three, that was category two, category three is that they are um, there's insufficient data to decide whether they are grass gray or they are not grass gray. So the committee publishes its report in the Federal Register. There is a period for public comment on the committee's report. The FDA interpretation of the um, committee's report is also published in the Federal Register. The FDA's interpretation is subject to public comment. Um, then there's this tentative final monograph that comes out, which is uh, the FDA is proposing, okay, this is what we're going to do about whether or not this is grass slash gray. And uh, technically, that tentative final monograph uh, has um, the function of being a notice of proposed rulemaking. So it's like a pre-regulation uh, from which more comment from the public is collected. And finally, a final monograph. These are in a series of monographs is the medium through which OTC drugs are registered. It is issued usually about a year later. Another way to get to be an OCT is to do the RX, you know, the prescription drug, to OCT switch, and this is becoming increasingly common. Um, this is usually done by supplementing drugs NDA with a, with a, with a supplement application. Um, if it involves new clinical investigations, you might be able to get an additional three years of marketing exclusivity, as we discussed earlier. And uh, However, the competitors can also take certain legal actions to try to request denial of that exclusivity. Um, let's talk now a little bit, we have just a few more minutes left, about uh, expedited pathways for getting to drugs. Um, and let's start off, first of all, with the treatment IND. The 1987 FADAMA uh, uh, allows uh, investigational drugs to be uh, provided outside of controlled clinical trials. This is, how do I get access to an IND drug? I'm dying. They're testing this thing. I can't get in the study. I want the drug. Um, this is how you can do it. Uh, the standard is that it has to be a life-threatening disease. Um, there has to be scientific evidence as, uh, as a, that as a whole provides a reasonable basis for concluding that the drug may be effective and would not expose the patient to undue unreasonable risk. The issue is this, the manufacturer may extend the drug to individual patients. This is also sometimes under the category of what's called compassionate use. Sometimes there's not a lot of compassion out there. Sometimes the manufacturers don't. So you need three parties to agree in order for compassionate use to occur. One is a doctor who says, I'm ready to give my patient this drug. Second is a company that says, I'm willing to give the drug out. And finally, you need the FDA. In reality, whenever you have the first two, the doctor and the company willing to do that and willing to come forward to the FDA, it's generally speaking uh, unlikely that the FDA is going to turn um, people away. There is, are conditions under which this can be done uh, as codified by FADAMA in emergency access. Uh, and uh, Fidelma regulates the shipment of drugs for emergency access. And lastly, 
on this topic of um, additional early patient access, there is this notion of fast-track approval, and you will hear about fast-track approval. The first step in fast-track is that the sponsor has to re request that the FDA designate a fast-track, uh, a drug as a fast-track product. And if it's given, the law permits the approval on the basis of, quote, surrogate endpoints, okay? But it may uh, requ still require a phase four commitment. So let's take, um, for example, if we have one of the inborn errors of metabolism, like fetal ketonuria, if you were to accept that the fetal ketone level in your, um, in your blood would be a good surrogate endpoint, um, then that drug may get into fast track and be approved on the basis of that surrogate endpoint rather than a clinically relevant endpoint like uh, survival or um, likelihood of psych future psychiatric uh, admission or any number of other things um, that are clinically relevant to the patient. Instead, relying on this surrogate endpoint for, um, for the approval. But as I said, the sponsor may still be required to, uh, to encumber a phase four commitment. And um, drugs that undergo um, fast track approval process have different promotional requirements, and they are also, uh, at least theoretically, easier to withdraw from the marketplace afterwards. Okay, combination drugs. What is a combination drug? It's when you've got two drugs, um, and each make a combination, a, 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 a contribution to the claimed effect, okay? So um, one might be a propranolol HCTZ um, combination, which has both make a contribution to lowering blood pressure. Okay, hydrochlorothiazide. I'm sorry, it's HCTZ. Uh, you know, the 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 regulation that regulates um, combination drugs basically just says you can have combination products, and it appears to be permissive, but in truth, the way that it is used generally is to require. Um, evidence not only for each component, but it needs to, um, the key concept is that prior efficacy and safety results on the individual components cannot be extrapolated to the proposed drug combination. So it's the combination itself which must undergo its clinical testing, that this combination of these two products are actually what is going to result. So you don't have to, you, you cannot come to the agency and say, hey, I've got a combination product and we showed over here that this drug works and we showed over here that that drug works, um, so just approve us. The agency will want to know how is the combination itself working on the disease. Okay, now for something entirely different. The, this uh, chapter also considers uh, animal new drugs. Uh, the good news is that the AMD, uh, sorry, the NADA the new animal drug application process is very similar to humans. Um, new drugs are um, explicitly include, however, they also explicitly include drugs for animal feed, but it excludes the feed itself, but the drugs that are in the feed um, are included, and, and that happens a great deal with animal foods. Um, there are similar divisions into the approval process into preclinical and clinical testing. Um, I guess one of the great advantages is you can do vivisection, which you can't do on human beings, um, in the study of these drugs, but the drugs still need to be shown to be safe and effective, just as they are for humans. Um, similarly, uh, there is a generic process for animal drugs called the Generic Animal Drug and Patent Term Restoration Act, is sort of the animal version of Hack, Watch Hacks, Hatch Waxman. Um, the differences concern things like animal feed, and another key difference is that the toxicology studies that are done in animals for meat animals have to be very uh, held to a much higher bar than the toxicology studies that are done for human studies. Why? Because we need to know if people eat those foods, um, what kinds of uh, adverse events they can have. So if we're talking about meat animals um, or milk or egg animals, um, there are other concerns. And I need to mention again here the Delaney Clause. This is the, uh, the provision that the FDA may not approve a product if it is going to uh, end up uh, causing, if it has ever been shown to cause cancer in humans or animals. And so um, that is a key, a key issue. 
Animal biologics, however, so we just talked about animal drugs. Animal biologics are a different matter entirely. They're not even regulated by the FDA. How about that? Um, unlike humans, uh, these are regulated by the USDA under the 1993 Virus Serum and Toxin Act, or the VST Act, uh, and it's makes, which makes it illegal to ship a virus, serum, or toxin unless the product is um, prepared under USDA establishment regulations. So USDA's regulations in this regard do parallel FDA's animal drug regulations. Um, so there is at least that uh, continuity. But you should know that animal biologics are not regulated by the FDA. Uh, okay, biologicals. Now we get into the uh, business of biologicals in humans. You saw that um, originally I had thought of breaking these two lectures into mm -hmm. humans and biologics. However, the biologics process is so similar to the drugs process that um, in the 40 pages that carry the uh, day of um, uh, drugs and biologics approval, only four pages is separately um, uh, discussed for biologics. Um, biologics are defined as a virus, therapeutic serum, toxin, antitoxin, vaccine, blood, blood component, or derivative, uh, allergic, uh, allergenic, excuse me, allergenic product or analogous uh, product. Uh, an allergenic product or an analogous to an allergenic product, uh, asphenamine or derivatives. Now that that really that really um, I, I'm sorry, arsphenamine or its derivative derivatives, which are arsenicals. Um, that's really surprised me that those particular ones were called out as biologics. I didn't know that prior to this, but um, any of those kinds of products which are used in the treatment or cure uh, or prevention of a disease or condition in human beings are by definition, biologicals, okay? So these are all products that are really poorly characterized. They're important, um, intravenous immunoglobulin, um, tissues, um, viruses, all those kinds of things that are um, not clear crystalline particular molecules are considered biologicals. Um, originally, biologicals were uh, licensed through a process which is quite different from drugs. Uh, they uh, they needed to uh, provide a product licensing application and in a separate uh, establishment licensing application. In part, this is because the process is part of what gets um, licensed with a biologic. Uh, uh, FADAMA and the FDA uh, said that the FDA shall take all measures to minimize the difference in the review between uh, drugs and biologics. And the BLA came into place, the Biologics Licensing Application, you should know that there was a major reorganization back in 2003. I was there at the agency at the time, not as a, at OOPD, but in a previous job. And um, a lot of the biologicals were removed from CEDAR and moved over in, excuse me, removed from CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and brought over into CEDAR. So that they followed the same um, culture, even though they were still processed under a BLA, the same culture as drug review. So Botox was one of those products. Um, the TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor um, products, blockers, were brought into that process and, and others. Uh, so all biologics are still licensed under the Public Health Service Act. That's the other thing you need to know. Rather than Section 505 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So biologics, because they're processed under the Public Health Service Act, and they don't have an NDA process, they're not eligible for the statutory exclusivity provisions that we spoke of earlier, which are found under Section 505. Nor are there generic biologics. So there's no biosimilars at the time of this writing. However, um, there have been um, additional developments just within the last year that I'm not going to speak about right now because I don't know all of their intricacies well enough to, to discuss, but we can talk about that later in class. Um, biologicals can get orphan drugs, though. You do need to know that. That's the one exclusivity that they can, in fact, get. With that, we've just about run out of time. We've covered a tremendous amount of material uh, in this section, part two, of um, the drugs and biologics approval process, and we look forward um, to the next lecture shortly. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.